Dresden, a great, beautiful, and historic city so far barely touched by the war, believed by its inhabitants to be somehow inviolate, became, in the technical language of the experts, a severe case of overbombing. We had so many refugees who had come from the Eastern Front that at this point the city had swollen to double its size. The only man we had in the city was a veteran's hospital, with blind and crippled. The blind were trying to carry the cripples and they couldn't see their way. And some people who tried to walk along, they were pulled in by the fire. They all of a sudden disappeared right in front of you. Somebody put, there's such a draft in a firestorm like that, it's the most horrible thing. You have to save yourself or try to get as far away from the fire because the draft pulls you in. Next day came the Americans, a Western demonstration of support for the Russians now less than 100 miles away. Over 1,300 flying fortresses to pound the ruins of a city. The city was, of course, in flames, but after three days, we had to go in and try to find the people and take them out of the ruins. And sometime a wash basin full contained nine, ten people because their size had shrunk to just a small amount. I was just couldn't believe that this was a whole person. And this picture is just terrible. I saw sometimes uh, two people close together who maybe in despair had all. There was one tiny little figure. In the center of the city, cordoned off from the survivors, they built great funeral piles. There was no time to dig individual graves. We had to make big mass graves. They tried to identify by jewelry or by belongings, but many people could not be identified. Later on the ruins, you found inscription, uh, Hans, are you alive? Martha, are you still in the ruins? Industrial damage was slight. The railway was working again in three days. But over 100,000 died. Dresden was another monument to total war. The last Nazi newsreel the Germans saw. It features scratch units in action on the Eastern Front, on German soil. The slogans now play on sexual fear of the Red Hordes. The main propaganda weapon, stories of rape, stereotyped accounts backed by dubious pictures in which the corpses may for once be German. Tales of brutal and licentious soldiery told in the stock language of racial hatred, beasts, rape, 
animals, bestiality. Refugees from Germany's eastern provinces and the occupied territories. Families were separated, never to be reunited. Thousands died from drowning, thousands from shelling. The great German Reich was shrinking. The Germans coming home. On the Western Front, the Allied air forces ranged at will beyond the Rhine, paralyzing all movement in preparation for the final assault. With bombs, rockets, and cannon fire, they struck at bridges, railways, roads, at a single horse and cart. It was my duty to tell Hitler that from the point of view of armaments, the war was lost. And um, I did it in several memorandums, and the harshest one was uh, the 19th of March, uh, 45, in which I told him very bluntly, which uh, nobody dared to tell, that uh, the war will be finished within four or six weeks. Hitler boasted of losses in infantry being made good by countless numbers of new units. He himself presented medals to his new recruits. What they lacked in experience, they made up for in National Socialist ardor. A young company runner reports how he carried weapons up to the front line. Als der Russe näher an Lauern heranrückte, meine Aufgabe bestand darin, Meldungen zu den einzelnen Kompaniegefechtsständen. His reward, an Iron Cross, second class. March the 24th, the Rhine crossing. Montgomery's last showpiece battle. Upstream, the Americans slipped across almost unopposed. The goal the field commanders had in mind, Berlin. Cross the Rhine now. From the Dutch border to the Black Forest in the south, the Allied columns pushed on into the heart of Germany through scenes that were the commonplace of war. Towns and villages that burned, as the towns and villages of Poland, France, Russia, Yugoslavia, and Greece had burned. But for these civilians, for the women and children who saw the war go past, there were no ghettos and no gas chambers. Only in some, a sense of anger. The first time I have had hatred against Hitler and the Nazis was not hatred against the terror regime. It was hatred like among gangsters. Hitler promised us to win the half of the world, and he asked us to help him, and so we have done. And now we have nothing, we have only our closest. The collapse of Nazi government had left a vacuum. The advancing troops were politically innocent. Their methods were rough and ready. The Burgermeister, the first one you meet, He'd have his sash on and a badge of office, and he would inform us that he was not a Nazi, the town council was not, and we would promptly round them all up and ship them out because we knew we had all the Nazis. You put soldiers with townspeople, and after the first couple of hours of a small amount of tension, when both parties realized that the other one was not going to stab them suddenly, uh, we'd find ourselves swapping... Uh, a hardtack or chocolate for a, a cooked meal by one of the German families. And they in turn would uh, show us family pictures, not the uh, uniform ones. And then you'd find a GI showing his family to them. And uh, 
It's funny how the feeling could change so rapidly. Some woman came to me, uh, in addition to trying to offer me her own services, she was trying to obtain something else, and I looked at her. And I was feeling particularly mean that day. My father was sick, and the Red Cross had given me information through cable, and my younger brother-in-law had been killed in, in Germany, and the word just come to me, and I was about ready to tear anyone apart anyway with my own two hands. And she said to me, and I said, you know, in desperation almost, I said, look, don't bother me. You know, you're dealing with a Jew. You don't want to have anything to do with me. And she looked at me and she said, Ober sie sind ein Weißer Jude, which you can translate, but you are a white Jew. And I did everything to restrain myself and just belting her right in the mouth. The camps were overrun. Many Germans had known of them. Others had preferred not to know. Now they were forced to see. In one place, the mayor and his wife went home and hanged themselves. This is Buchenwald. Those who had survived deportation, slave labor, selection for the death camps, starvation, were from every country in Europe, of all callings, of many religions, many political faiths. Some turned on their oppressors. Allied prisoners were free. German soldiers went into captivity. Displaced persons, ordinary Germans, prisoners of war, passed on the roads and had nothing to say to each other. Germany was an ant heap some giant had kicked to pieces. Here and there, looting, brief opportunities to celebrate the collapse of the system. The victors had their own views on law and order. Some property was still sacred. Berlin was more ruins than a town, mainly in the center of Berlin. One uh, couldn't find almost no building which was still intact. But it was my wish to have the Berlin Philharmonics having a concert the last time. I knew that it would be my last concert for a long time, perhaps forever. 
And um, I, um, uh, I invited um, friends and, and, uh, and as much pe people as possible to go in. We were sitting there in our coats uh, because there was no heating, it was cold and it was shivering. And uh, in this atmosphere of destruction um, and uh, misery, the concert started and we started with uh, the last part of uh, the Götter Demo. Hitler no longer made public appearances. More and more he withdrew to his underground headquarters beneath the Imperial Chancellery, the bunker. When I came back from this uh, concert for the military uh, conference, we came in the bunker and uh, Hitler was almost out of his mind and Goebbels was already there and Hitler showed to us the, the, the wires they just received of the death of uh, Roosevelt and uh, Goebbels was jumping up and saying, that's it, that's it, now we have it, got it and uh, now I think uh, everything will turn to the better. In the east, over railway lines converted to the broad Russian gauge, the Russian command was piling up vast supplies of material. Six armies were involved. Their object? To smash the German forces on the approaches to Berlin and take the capital of Nazi Germany. On the 75th anniversary of Lenin's birth, the 16th of April, 1945, the massed artillery opened fire. Shut, shut. My, my heart was, you know, was going smaller and I, I get very anxious because I, I knew the, the, the attack began. The first barrage was less effective than Zhukov had hoped. The Germans were still secure in their second line of defense. In the center of the front, opposite Berlin, there were 400 guns to the mile to open a way for the assault tank. Red Army was over the Oder, reinforcing and breaking out of its bridgehead. The armored columns pushed ahead against desperate resistance. Some of our young boys, you know, they jumped out of the hordes, you know, had their panzer fast, and they were shooting to, to the tanks and they destroyed all the four tanks, and the others were shooting with their guns and, and kill all the, the Russian soldiers. And um, the Russian must have been before in a magazine like or in a factory, in a sweet factory, because they had all the arms full of sweet and chocolate. Everybody in our unit was 15 and 16, and they're running onto the street for the chocolate. In the West, it was a different story. Sidestepping pockets of the enemy, the Allied columns moved east. You could pick up the telephone in those days and ring up the next village that's still German occupied and this chain was working and say, hello, what's happening down there? And one had almost moved into a, a, a dream-like and unreal situation where one, <clears throat> you know, towns and villages flew by, no resistance at all, normal, uh, normal countryside, no damage at all. And... Uh, Every day one said to oneself, now surely this can't go on. And uh, certainly I think one's, the thought of one's own survival after all this gradually became more and more uppermost. When one did run into any sort of determined resistance, to me it was a matter of the half anger. I think, what are these, how dare these people uh, 
prolong the agony anymore, and the other half is a darn nearly blue fun. Wurzel, a little town in northern Germany, 30 miles short of the Elbe. Here, the Germans did stand and fight. There was an edginess now among the Allied fighting men. Their fingers quick on the trigger. Their opponents were elite troops and officer cadets. It took a four-day battle with considerable losses and many civilian deaths before resistance collapsed. Mostly the Germans surrendered thankfully enough. Their main aim, to go into captivity with the Anglo-Americans rather than with the Russians on whose land and population they had inflicted such losses. Desperately they strove to reach safety in the West. In the Ruhr pocket, over 300,000 men of Army Group B were surrounded and forced to surrender. The Western Allies had achieved their main objective, the destruction of the German land forces in the West. Erst in it wasn't until the first half of April that he retired to the bunker because the air raids were getting worse and more frequent. The bunker was divided up in such a way that in the lower area there was a military conference chamber with an anteroom which led to Hitler's study, his workroom and bedroom led off this anteroom, and also a room with a bathroom for Eva Braun. But for Eva Braun. There were some women in Hitler's former life who were important for him, but I think uh, since uh, during the last time, there was nobody as near and as close to him like Eva Braun. She loved him really. And she came surprisingly to Berlin and when she arrived, Hitler tried to seem angry, but he, didn't, he wasn't successful. His eyes were so full of joy and he was obviously so happy that she was there um, that nobody um, tried to, to send her back. The Russians were now firing on Berlin itself. Their forward troops already in the outskirts, fighting their way from street to street. So um, came his birthday, the 20th of April, and there came the congratulations and uh, everybody shook him his hand and wished him the best and and it was about, it was all very depressed it was not a, a happy birthday um, and when the official part was over Hitler retired at once but Eva Braun she invited some of the peoples to go upstairs in her little living room to make a birthday party and one found a record, uh, hit a song, like to dance, a dance music, music. And so we sat around the table and tried to forget our our miserable situation. And and there was laughing and, and joking and and everybody um, drank and and giggled and gackled and it was um, a very artificial um, sort of of gayness. Danach uh, fand noch eine Lagebesprechung statt, 
After that, there was another conference on the situation, but it was already apparent that it was getting near the end. Reichsleiter Bormann said to me that I should put everything in motion so that we would have luggage ready in case of a possible move to the Berghof in Berchtesgaden. He refused uh, absolutely and said, no, I cannot, go, uh, cannot leave Berlin. I have to make a decision here in Berlin or I have to go under. And um, this was the first one, the first time that he ever uh, mentioned the possibility that we could not win, we, that he mentioned uh, the, the, the chance of, of uh, defeat. And I remember the April 20th, 1945, that was the birthday of Adolf Hitler. And in the radio, there was a speech of Josef Goebbels, and he said, uh, Berlin will remain German, and Vienna will, Germ will be German again. And uh, my mother said, God thanks, we will win the war. And I said, Mother, you are wrong, and Goebbels is wrong. It's terrible, but I'm quite sure the war is over and we will lose the war. And my mother said, do you think in this hour Goebbels will tell us a lie? No, by if Berlin, the battle for Berlin itself was extremely difficult. It had to be taken street by street, house by house. Some of them nine and ten stories high, and there were lots of these houses. The fascists held out on every floor. They had also set up barricades in every street. They'd converted the main buildings into strong points against us. We are in Berlin now, and in this evening we just visited my mother, and you know she was very, nearly crying because she thought maybe I'm dead or something. And um, it was late in the evening, and we wanted to sleep there, but some men of the house they came and they said it's impossible, you can't sleep here because the, the Russian they are not far from here. And if they arrive here by, by night and they see you here with, with guns and so maybe, maybe they will shoot us. So we couldn't sleep there. We went over the street. There was a school and we slept there. On the 21st, we went on together into the outer ring of the suburbs of Berlin itself. The order of the day of our high command reverberated through the whole country. They were heard throughout the world. Our soldiers have broken into Berlin. Berlin. The Russians had worked out their tactics in detail, using models of streets and buildings. Behind the apparent chaos of the street fighting lay a precise plan to encircle the city and strike at the center. Some of these troops had come all across Russia, through territory the retreating Germans had looted, burned, destroyed. Berliners, sheltering in their cellars, wondered what their fate would be at Russian hands. Even the children had not been evacuated. They all lived in cellars. I went into the cellars and remember most of all the repetition of this phrase. When will this nightmare end? Suddenly, on April 22nd, I think, yes, 
There he come out of the military conference with a totally stony face and and uh, dark, threatened eyes, and he called us to come to this little ante room. And he sent for Eva Braun and for the secretaries and for the secretary of uh, for the cook who was still in Berlin who cooked for him. And then he came in and said with a monotone voice and so unkindly as we never have heard him speak to us. Ladies, please pack your uh, things at once. You have to go to uh, the south. The last ma the last aeroplane starts in about an hour. And then was a silent. No, he said it's it's all lost. There's no there's no hope. You have to go. And then was a moment of absolutely silence, and we stood like shocked. And suddenly, Eva Braun made a, sp a few steps, went to Hitler, and said. But you know I don't leave you. I stay on your side. You know that. Don't try to to send me away. And then Hitler um, did something very astonishing, what he never did, and nobody had ever seen such a guest. He kissed her on his on her lips. And um, then it happened that the other girls and and me too. We hear us saying, we, 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 we stay too. The um, situation in the bunga was uh, uh, a fantastic one, uh, one really can't, uh, uh, unrealistic one. Uh, one really can't uh, describe uh, how, the, how the moods went on and off like waves. Uh, sometimes they were all uh, exhilarating and were thinking, well, now uh, the Western uh, troops coming for uh, release of Berlin. Uh, Goebbels was exclaiming one of the biggest uh, decisions of, hit of uh, war Hitler just made. Uh, he, was, uh, he is now um, determined to uh, no more to fight against the Western, only to the East in Berlin. And uh, this will mean that the Western powers will uh, will uh, join us in our fight against Russia. And such uh, things happened every now and then, and then a few minutes afterwards, everybody was uh, speaking about uh, uh, suicide and how they are preparing it. Uh, Goebbels in details uh, uh, was uh, saying how uh, he will uh, let his uh, children uh, killed, which were already in the bunker. After a few days, the telegram came from Goering, which said, Mein Führer, no longer my beloved Führer, just my Führer. I know that you are now totally cut off and are no longer in possession of full freedom to command. According to the law of succession, I will now step into your position and will undertake to represent Germany both in internal and external matters. Yours, Göring. Hitler was so worked up over this. He sat in his chair and could not grasp it at first. This was added to by Bormann, who added fuel to the fire somewhat, so that Hitler then said, to give me an ultimatum, that really is the end. One day there came um, one of the men of the press bureau, press office, and um, brought the news. Um, he had, I think he had heard it by uh, radio from Reuter uh, news agency, that um, Himmler had have negotiations with uh, Graf Bernhard Dodd for capitulation. And Hitler was very upset because he held Himmler for his most faithful paladin and the most reliable one. And now he saw that also he had tried to betray him. 
he remembered suddenly that the poison which he had um, to use for himself um, were given to him from one of Himmler's uh, staff, and he mistrusted that it may affect. Perhaps uh, Himmler tried a dirty trick and and uh, gave him something like what only make him unconsciousness unconscious, so that um, he could be transported against his will out of the bunker and uh, delivered to the enemy. And to to test this he um, ordered um, a doctor to try to test this um, poison ca uh, capsule um, at the dog. So he said farewell to this creature. I think it was next Eva Brown, this one who stood next to him. And Blondie died very promptly. <laughs> A tiny handful of German anti-Nazis, the Russians came as liberated. On Tuesday morning, the 24th in the morning, we suddenly saw the, the Gestapo had disappeared. During the night, the whole prison was given over to normal, normal prison guards, old men, loved nice men. And when we saw that, the many of the uniforms, the, the, the Gestapo guards, had, had, had put away there. Uh, we said, now when the Russians take over, you are the man who will be killed, not me, not we. Let us out. They were very, uh, they said, no, we can't do that. Tonight the Gestapo will come back. And then we made, a, in the afternoon of Tuesday, we made, a, made an agreement with them and said, look, we will, uh, we will put out ourselves, we the prisoners, some guards on the roof and observe the uh, coming near of the, of the Russian front. And in the minute we hear uh, Russian gunfire, not only the artillery, shelling, then you let us out. They said, all right. When the door was open in the prison, there was with us a Jewish Russian doctor who was in concentration, inmate of Sachsenhausen, the, the famous and he, I don't know by what reason, was a month ago was brought by the Gestapo to our prison to do the d most dirty jobs in the prison all the time. And uh, we couldn't contact him much, but we knew him, of course. Then he stood there on the street and where to go as a Russian. And I said, look, come with us. My, my mother-in-law will feed you. You can't come in our basement. And he went with me. When the first units of the Russians came two days later, he met them on the door, addressing them in Russian. He are all, all anti-fascists in this, in this basement. When the Russian came in in the end, we found, at least we found the first lot, the fighting troops which came in, they took away our watches, of course, and they were very cautious, and we could understand that. They took away things they liked, but they behaved very businesslike. They stayed in this house here, and they lived in this room, three or four of them, quite high officers, and they got up in the morning at eight o'clock, and then at nine o'clock they went out to the Tiergarten, which isn't very far from here, and behind the Tiergarten is or was the chancery where Hitler was still alive and fighting. They went out and did their job and came back five o'clock in the afternoon sharp, and then they asked me down here to play the piano and uh, give them a little tune, and then we drank together we sang together. Suddenly we saw the first Russian soldiers. They knocked at our door, came in and uh, were very kind. Said to my uh, mother and to me if uh, there were German soldiers in the house or asked for weapons. 
and then they left. But uh, the next Russians were quite different. Um, one of them raped me and uh, other inhabitants of the house. These two women who were living next door, they were killed and, and we weren't able to bury them because the shelling was still going on. When the Russians came along and they asked us, where are your women? We want to have your women. Or, Frau, 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 they said in German, or they called German. So uh, I had the trick, or I found the trick, to take them to these two dead bodies. I opened the carpet and said, this is my Frau here, I can't supply you with any women. These are the only two women we, we knew here, which we had. And the Russians kneeled down some of them and made the cross and said little prayers, which was very astounding, and got up again and kissed me because they thought I was the widower. <laughs> and. Uh, gave me presents, gave me cigarettes, gave me bread, clapped me on, my, me on my shoulder and went off again and got what they wanted, probably the next house or in the next street. Every night time I used to go home to see my mother and have to get something to eat and some cigarettes and so because we didn't get any food at daytime. And uh, uh, my mother was, was Every time, every night, she was very lucky to see me again, naturally. And uh, so my mother asked me, and also other people from, from our house, they asked me, just take your uniform out, stay here, and, and don't go back to, to fighting. And, and uh, always I said, no, I, I can't do it. I, I couldn't stay at home safe, you know, and they are still fighting. Zhukov called the Battle of Berlin one of the most difficult battles of the war. It cost the Russians over a hundred thousand men. Total German losses are unknown. The storming of Berlin continued. The encircling ring round the whole city and round the center of Berlin itself was being drawn tighter and tighter. Only a few hundred yards separated us from the viper's nest of Hitler's headquarters, the Imperial Chancellery. Then he began my uh, last will. And he, then he dictated me at first his private will and afterwards his um, political testimony. And uh, I must confess that I was, I was at first in a very excited uh, mood because I expected that I would be the first and the only one who knows who will, he is going to know the explanation and the declaration why the war had come to this end and why um, why Hitler couldn't stop and why why the development and why the, the catastrophe. The, I, I I thought now I will I will come the the moment of the truth and I was heart bumping when I wrote down what Hitler said. But he used nothing new. He, he came out with his um, old phrases. He repeated his accusations, his, um, his uh, revenge swearing to the enemy and to the Jewish uh, uh, capitalistic system and 
and then he he announced in the in the uh, second part of the history of the political testament he announced a new government Eva Braun hatte es bis dahin fertig gebracht Eva Braun had by now persuaded the Führer to the point where he actually wanted to improvise a marriage service to her. Hochzeit improvisieren wolle. Man holte zu diesem Zweck To do this, they got an official from the Propaganda Ministry aus dem Propaganda Ministerium, der als Standes who would fulfill the function of registrar. I joined the others on this uh, little uh, uh, workroom from of Hitler, and the, they are sit, they were sitting there around the table, and so I had to to congratulate Eva Braun, and I I I, I, did, I was a little um, a little shy what to say, and and I, I, I shake hand to her, and she said, "Oh, you can say Fra Mrs. Hitler to me now," and I did. On the rocket. This is for the Reichstag. Others said, remember Stalingrad. Remember the Ukraine. Remember the widows and children. Remember the tears. Hitler had now drawn his conclusions. He said farewell to everybody. I was the last one he came to. Hitler said to me, I have given the order to break out. You should break out in groups. Join one of these groups and try to get through to the West. Then I asked Hitler, for whom should we fight on for now? And to that Hitler said in a monotone, for the coming man. I saluted him, he gave me his hand, and I disappeared out of the room. Suddenly, there was a bang, there was a the, the shot, and it was obviously in within the bunker, because the, 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 cast, the noises of the outside um, uh, shooting we were uh, we, we know we know how they uh, sound and um, the little boy of Goebbels he noticed and he, he noticed that that was another sound he said oh that was a bullseye that was a bullseye and I uh, thought yes you are right that was really a bullseye ich trat mit dem damaligen Reichsleiter Bormann I went into Hitler's workroom with the former Reichsleiter Bormann, and this picture presented itself to us. Hitler was sitting on the left of the sofa, with his face bent slightly forward and hanging down to the right. With the 7.65, he had shot himself in the right temple. The blood had run down onto the carpet, and from this pool of blood, a splash had got onto the sofa. Gekommen. Rechts von ihm saß Eva Braun. Eva Braun was sitting on his right. Eva Braun had drawn both her legs up onto the sofa and was sitting there with cramped lips so that it immediately became clear to us that she had taken cyanide. I took Hitler by his neck. Behind me were two other officers from his bodyguard. And so we took Hitler's body and proceeded with it into the park. In the park, we laid the In the park, we laid the bodies together next to each other and poured the available petrol over them. In the Reich Chancellery Park, there was fire all around. 
Her draft had got up so that we could not set the corpses alight with an ordinary match. Daraufhin drehte ich einen Fidibus aus Nachrichtenmaterial. So I twisted a taper out of some paper from a notebook and Reichleiter Bormann, who meanwhile had also come upstairs with others like Dr. Goebbels, Bergdorf and some officers, lit the taper and I threw the taper onto the bodies and in an instant the corpses were set alight. Die Leichen in Brand gesetzt. That night we were the first to take the fight into the Chancellor itself. Our objective was to be the planting of our banner on the building itself. There was a group of us. Our group consisted of me, Salajan, Alimov, an Uzbek who was the young communist organizer of our battalion. He and his young communists had fought through with us together. They protected me so that I could fight my way in to hoist the flag. They gave me the banner to enable me to get into the building itself and hoist it up. Having got into the building, we started making our way up the staircase towards the attic. Some fascists opened up on us and Salajan was hit in the head and fell. His friends rushed forward to him while I had to make it upstairs to plant the banner. And having made my way onto the roof through a shell hole, I secured our red banner with a length of telegraph wire. When the armies of East and West met in the heart of Germany, there was a brief moment of warmth and comradeship. Well, we can't speak Lingo, but we can fight the same way together, can we? Yes. Well, all the best, old man. I'm very, very glad to have met you. Very glad indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. We don't understand the language, but we mean the same thing. The Red Army saw themselves as liberators, not avengers. The crimes of Hitler's Reich had to be paid for. It was the ordinary German who paid. 